Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Monday, December 18th, 2023. It's my great pleasure to be here with Dr. Robert McCune. Bob, it's great to be with you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Okay, good to be here. Thank you. Bob, to start, uh, please tell me if you have any current titles and institutional affiliations. Um, well, I have, uh, <laughs> I have emeritus status at Jefferson Lab. Um, and I have emeritus status at the College of William and Mary, where I was on the faculty while I was in Virginia. It was kind of a courtesy appointment. And I just recently uh, signed up with Lawrence Berkeley Lab as something they call an affiliate, which uh, allows me access to go on site and attend seminars and things like that. It's about 45 minutes away, so I anticipate going down there maybe a couple times a month. Um, and I know quite a few people there, so. Bob, I'm trying me. to keep in touch with the physics uh, world, you know, both in, in all of these aspects. Given yeah. your long perspective on these things, what's currently interesting to you in nuclear physics and more broadly particle physics? Oh, uh, well, um, I've had a, a, a long interest in uh, these ghostly particles known as neutrinos and studied them quite a bit. And so I, uh, I keep up on what's going on uh, with those, uh, those kinds of things. Um, there's uh, also the, the program at Jefferson Lab. I keep tabs on that. Um, some of the projects that I managed to help get started when I was there are uh, now launched and things are happening and so I tend to try to keep track of what's happening with those. Um, I, um, I'm always still interested in cosmology and astrophysics and so um, you know and I, I try to read the journals. I, actually I read I read articles more broadly than I used to when I was active in research because I was so busy doing my own thing. Now I have time to browse around and read things on my own, which is which is kind of fun. Bob, your work, has it been more on the experimental side or the theoretical side? Uh, yeah, almost all experiment, yes. So, What have been some of the major technologies that have propelled the experiments that you've been involved in? Hmm. Um, well, there's uh, the development of accelerator, uh, tech, particle accelerator technology was very important. Um, in fact, um, when I started at Caltech, there was uh, the beginnings of uh, a, a subject called accelerator mass spectrometry, where people actually used particle accelerators for the first time to do mass spectrometry. And um, that's actually where I partially, part of the way, part of the reason I got the idea for doing this uh, fractional charge search experiment uh, with an accelerator. Um, and um, a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of the work I did, we used uh, electron uh, accelerators to accelerate electrons and um, a big topic that got started back in, the late 70s and early 80s when I got interested in this was uh, what's called uh, spin, uh, uh, the, the use of spin in electron experiments. So you, both you have the beams can be, uh, can have spin. So they all, all, all the electrons in the beam have their spins pointed in the same direction. Um, and, uh, and also you can make uh, targets where the uh, atomic nuclei have all their spins oriented in the same direction. And that was a new concept back then to utilize these, um, these new uh, features uh, of doing experiments with electrons. And so a lot of my work involved using uh, these uh, spin dependent uh, effects in electron scattering. Bob, I wonder if you can reflect on the interplay of theory and experiment in your career. In what ways have theorists provided intellectual guideposts to, to help you design the experiments themselves and what to look for? And then the converse of that, how have some of the experimental results that you've been a part of 
propelled the theory forward? Yes. So, well, these um, um, these uh, spin dependent effects and electron scattering were written down, were just being written down by theorists back in seventies and eighties, and um, and so it was all, it was like a new field to be able to study these things, and uh, it gave you access to all kinds of uh, new and interesting properties of nuclei particles, uh, and you could uh, test uh, the uh, what's known as the weak force or weak interaction using them. Um, and even more recently, um, something that I didn't do myself, but I got started at Jefferson Lab was measuring. Uh, you can measure the, the neutron distribution in a heavy nucleus like lead. And this can be related to the properties of neutron stars, uh, which are measured using gravitational wave uh, experiments like LIGO. So it ties together these things from astrophysics all the way down to the microscopic atomic uh, and nuclear physics. Um, so it's, it's uh, really quite interesting. Um, but it all started with, with theorists writing down what you can measure. And, uh, and then, of course, now the theorists pick up the, uh, the nuclear physics and the astrophysics and put it together uh, in, a, in a very unique way. Uh, now that we have all of this information, both from the astrophysics experiments and from the nuclear physics experiments. Um, this, studying neutrinos has been very interesting, too, because when I was young, I mean, this, you know, the neutrinos were first observed in uh, the 1950s coming from nuclear reactors. And so we knew they existed. Um, but um, one of the things that actually Caltech played a very important role in, the fellow in the Kellogg lab where I worked uh, before I got there named John Bacall, who worked with Willie Fowler, who was a professor. And uh, he uh, worked out uh, the quantitative uh, predictions for neutrinos coming from the sun due to the, the fusion reactions that power the sun. And um, a radio chemist from Brookhaven National Lab figured out how to build a big liquid uh, experiment underground in South Dakota to, um, to detect these solar neutrinos. And they were, um, it, it was remarkable he found them, uh, but the, the theoretical predictions were off by about a factor of three. It was only one third of the solar neutrinos were there. And it took many, many years before this, uh, we found a resolution to this that involved several experiments uh, in the early 2000s. And, um, and then, you know, so then that led to us knowing that actually the neutrinos are not massless, as was originally thought. They actually have finite masses. Uh, and uh, they can, uh, the different flavors of neutrinos can turn into each other. And all of this has been observed. And all of it was, was sort of predicted in a very speculative fashion by theorists. But uh, until we did the experiments, uh, it wasn't clear. And then, of course, now um, we want to study this in more detail. At least other people will using uh, an experiment called DOOM that shoots a beam of neutrinos from Fermilab to South Dakota. And uh, they want to try to study whether this, uh, the properties of neutrinos can explain why the universe contains matter rather than antimatter, or rather than equal amounts of matter and antimatter, uh, which is a big mystery. So, uh, so it all leads to new things, new ideas, that then generate new ideas for new experiments. And uh, it's, 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 you know, it's a fascinating, fascinating subject. Bob, of course, you came of age scientifically just as the standard model was coming together. What do you see as your contributions or what is the relevance of your research, both in building the standard model and then, of course, as everybody is trying to do right now, going to physics beyond the standard model? Right. Well, I mean, I even began, you know, my, my PhD work involved uh, testing uh, the standard model, the weak interaction. Uh, we didn't find anything wrong with it there. Um, and, you know, so there's there's sort of two aspects of how this is done. One is you build the highest energy uh, accelerate, high, highest energy accelerator experiment that you can, uh, such as is done at CERN these days, and, and directly uh, attack the, what's called the energy frontier, 
Uh, the other is to work at the, at the precision frontier, or, uh, where you do very precise experiments at low energies and look for uh, things to go wrong. And um, so I did quite a few of those kinds of experiments, uh, which constrained uh, all kinds of new ideas about uh, uh, the, the standard model. But um, uh, we didn't find anything new until we uh, were working on uh, neutrinos in the early 2000s. So there was a big uh, breakthrough in 1998, where a, a, a large experiment underground in Japan uh, saw what um, a, an anomaly in the distribution of neutrinos coming uh, from the sky, from cosmic neutrinos that were, that they're generated in the upper atmosphere by cosmic rays, and um, this was the first evidence that the neutrinos could. Uh, could change from one uh, one flavor to the other, and uh, and and it would require that they have mass because if they were massless, they wouldn't do that. Uh, and so we started working um, on. I, I I went to a conference around then, and everybody was excited about this. And I heard about another new experiment being proposed in Japan called Camland, and uh, this was to build a big uh, scintillator detector. Uh, in the same uh, in the same underground facility in Japan, um, and so um, I teamed up with some people who had been working with a, another professor at Caltech uh, doing uh, neutrino physics, uh, Felix Bohm, and he was retiring, and we uh, uh, got together with the Japanese along with other American collaborators and built this Camland experiment, and that actually showed for the first time you could see the pattern of the neutrinos oscillating from one flavor to the other. And, um, and and it all looked exactly like the theorists would predict, except we we found that the, uh, the amount of mixing that, that caused this effect was much larger than they would have predicted. So it's actually a surprise. Um, and, and then we had to do, it was clear after that, that the next experiment was uh, to do uh, an experiment closer to uh, reactor, nuclear reactors. And we did this in China with some collaborators from China. And then we measured the last, uh, the last uh, angle called mixing angle in the neutrino matrix uh, in this experiment, uh, in a, which was at a power station near, um, near Zhenzhen, uh, which is close to Hong Kong in China. Um, and so that was very exciting too, because uh, you know this really kind of cemented this theory of neutrino oscillations together. Um, and as I said, it, it provides the impetus for you know the new experiments that are being done today. What are the big open questions at the beginning of your career that feel more or less resolved? What feels as new as when you first encountered it? And from all of that discovery, what new questions? can we ask today that weren't even possible 50 years ago? Mm, well, that's big. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the neutrino story, of course, was, uh, you know, uh, when I started out, um, there was no, uh, no established evidence for neutrinos to have mass or any of these things. And there was the solar neutrino problem for many years. This, this had been known since the 60s. Um, and I think largely that's resolved, except for these other lingering questions of how to, uh, how you know, how does matter versus matter antimatter asymmetry come about, so forth. Um, and so those uh, those you know, so there's been great progress, but there's still more to do, as is usual. Um, cosmology has really come a long way. Uh, not that I worked on cosmology, but I was always interested in cosmology. Um, when I was a graduate student, I used, I, I used to, at, at Princeton, where I, where I went to graduate school, you were encouraged to do independent study. So rather than take all the courses to prepare, prepare me for exams, I wanted to take courses in things like cosmology to learn about something really new. And so I would go uh, to cosmology lectures. And, and in fact, once I went to a, a seminar on, on black holes by a fellow I had never heard of before. In fact, most people hadn't. Uh, it turned out to be Stephen Hawking, <laughs> and I was, of course, astonished when they wheeled him in in a wheelchair and some guy wrote on the blackboard for him. Uh, and you know, but 
what we've learned about cosmology, I remember back uh, in the early 2000s, experiments were just measuring the cosmic microwave background radiation with precision. Um, some of them at Caltech, it was very exciting. Uh, and that subject is, you know, again, it's, we know, it's, a, it's astonishing how much we know about cosmology and have determined over the last few decades. And there's, you may know, there's, there's, there's still more to do because there's a problem because if you, if you uh, determine the Hubble constant for the expansion of the universe using cosmology, you get a different answer than if you measure it directly uh, in, in astrophysical objects. So there is a puzzle there that everyone is, is concerned about. Um, and then, you know, um, I think what was really interesting too, when I first went to Caltech, um, they had hired at about the same time, but he was a, he was a senior professor. I was, came in as an assistant professor, uh, a fellow by the name of Ron Drever, who Caltech hired uh, to develop the idea of just an R and D project. It wasn't any, nobody thought you would be detecting gravity waves anytime soon, <laughs> but he just wanted to learn how, how to, how to develop the technique. And uh, so he built a lab uh, at, at Caltech on campus there and, uh, you know, studied how to make the interferometers work. And he had many of the ideas that went into eventually what was LIGO. And I watched this whole LIGO thing develop uh, as, you know, as a spectator. It was amazing. Uh, and who would have thought 40 years later that they would actually, uh, they would actually see events uh, where, you know, neutron stars coalesce and, uh, black holes and so forth. Um, so that's, you know, uh, opened a whole new field and it's just amazing, uh, compared to where we were back in 1980. It's, it's astonishing. But for all of the advances in cosmology, of course, there's dark matter and dark energy. Yes. Over the long term, what do you think the potential impact of the neutrino research, neutrino oscillations might be in possibly understanding dark matter or dark energy? Well, that's interesting. I, you know, when I was young and starting out, and people imagined that neutrinos might have mass, and um, and that they might be dark matter, uh, because you know, even back then, you had the uh, the, the galaxy, what they call the galaxy rotation curves, where uh, uh, Vera Rubin and others uh, were able to determine that there was dark matter around galaxies, um, and um, so. Um, you know, there were lots of speculations about what the dark matter could be. Um, and uh, the one was neutrinos, but it was soon established uh, at studying more about cosmology that the, that the neutrinos couldn't, were not a good candidate for dark matter. And, uh, so people started looking for other things, uh, uh, these heavier uh, things called weakly interacting massive particles, or WIMPs. Um, there were also axions were another new idea when I was uh, just starting out. And in fact, we even did a little experiment down in the basement of Kellogg lab looking for axions at one point. Didn't see them, but uh, and nobody else has seen them <laughs> since either, but they're still looking. Um, so um, there were lots of speculations about dark matter, and I don't think we're not there yet. Um, and so... Um, you know, it's a very interesting subject, but uh, it's going to take a while probably to figure that one out. And uh, there's dark energy as well, which is a, even more mysterious. That's right. You mentioned the importance over the course of your career of building ever bigger colliders and accelerators. A counterfactual, a what if question. Had the SSC been built, in what ways hmm. might that have been relevant for your research? And if you could use your imagination, what, what might we know today as a result? Well, yeah, that's interesting speculation. I think that, um, you know, I, I did not work at the so-called energy frontier myself. So um, although the accelerators I needed got bigger and higher energy, uh, I never worked quite at the, at the frontier as, uh, as you would if you were working at CERN today at the LHC. Um, the SSC... Uh, was uh, designed to be higher in energy uh, than the um, than the LHC, um, and you know very famous physicists would go 
and testify to Congress about why you needed this higher energy. <laughs> and um, the LHC, when the SSC got canceled, uh, the LHC was proposed uh, and it went in an existing tunnel. And so the size of the tunnel was fixed. And, um, and then depending on how strong uh, the, the bending magnets you can make, that determines the top energy. And so that what's, that's what determines the energy of the LHC and it's lower than the SSC. Now, the LHC has not found the new phenomena beyond the standard model uh, that people had uh, hoped that the SSC would find or that the LHC would find. And so perhaps those uh, famous theorists who testified to Congress, perhaps they were right. And you really just need more energy. And if we had built the SSC, who knows? Maybe we would be closer to figuring out uh, how this actually works and what, what, what the mystery of the uh, standard model is, um, and why it works so well and um, where it must break down. So. Um, it's, it's an interesting question. Yeah. I don't know for sure, but. Bob, what um, about supersymmetry? Where is supersymmetry in all of this for you? Um, yeah, well, I don't really work on, on that topic, but it's another way of, uh, trying to, uh, fix some of the problems with the standard model. Um, I think, um, you know, back in the day, it was, Murray Gell-Mann was, uh, was quite enamored with this uh, topic and, um, you know, he, he had always been right before, so maybe he's still right, I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's just harder to find uh, than people had thought. Um, but um, it's still a possibility, uh, although much of the parameter space that people had worked on to, to try and um, use supersymmetry to solve the problems with the standard model, a lot of the parameter space is now ruled out. And so it, it's looking less likely that this is uh, the correct answer, but you know, you, you can't be sure until, uh, until you do more experiments. So I'm sure that, <coughs> I'm sorry, in high energy physics, one's going to need even higher energy accelerators to uh, continue to uh, explore these ideas. Bob, of course, you're well positioned to reflect on the role of national laboratories in fundamental physics, the way that they work on their own, the way that they work with the academic community of physicists. What is that best par possible partnership to move physics forward between academic physicists and physicists working at the national laboratories? Sure, sure. I am... Um... I'm always amazed when I think back when we the way we did experiments in the earlier part of my career, um, and you know we we had uh, technical people, uh, pe you know people who knew how to design things and, and machinists could build things and so forth and electronics people, so uh, we could build things, um, but um, they weren't. I mean they were complex for the time, uh, but. As uh, the scientific instrumentation has become uh, ever more complex and uh, expensive is another issue, and you know, so um, you need uh, a structure uh, for people to work together as a team to build these larger, more complex things. Um, and I, I, you know, I must admit that you know, early days. It was just a pleasure to not have to deal. It's, it's kind of a form of bureaucracy that you have to deal with, um, and I, you know, I, it was a pleasure to 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 work without that. Um, but eventually, as things got bigger and bigger, and as you had to do your experiments at the facilities at these national laboratories, where they insisted that you have what's called project management, um, this became the way things are done. Um, it was interesting um, when we built Camland in Japan, the Japanese didn't do things that way. And they were also able to do things very quickly. The government just gave them all the money. And uh, we just went out there and, and built it. And it was amazing. Um, and then, you know, the next experiment I did was this experiment in China where we had two U.S. national laboratories that wanted to insist that this run like a U.S. project. 
And so they try to impose all of the rules and bureaucracy of U.S. projects on this. And it was a big, um, it was a big struggle because the, 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 uh, the Chinese physicists wanted to work in a somewhat different way. Um, another interesting example is LIGO itself, which I think started out uh, trying to do things the, uh, the old fashioned way. Uh, and um, eventually the NSF, uh, who was going to build LIGO, realized that this thing really needs some project management. And um, I think that's when, when they brought in Barry Barish into the project, who had a lot of project management experience from particle physics uh, experiments and accelerators. Um, and that made all the difference in uh, the ability of LIGO to go forward. Um, and so uh, it's, it's one of those things, it's just been a fact of life that, um, that things get uh, more complex and you need a more, uh, a more organized structure for people to be able to effectively work together. And actually a major part of this is also safety. I think back on all the things we did in the lab in the early days, I mean, you know, we were careful, but uh, we didn't have um, the uh, supervision and, and the structure to be able to really make sure that everyone worked safely. And I'm very thankful that over all those years, we, we worked with, without the oversight of safety experts that uh, no one, uh, no one got, uh, got hurt or injured. So that was, it's, it's, so that's one of those things that's, that's also a good byproduct of having this, um, it's bureaucracy, but it really uh, is, is kind of necessary to be able to build these kinds of experiments and facilities. Bob, given all of your, your, your service, all of your devotion to the APS, the American Physical Society over the years, What's so important to you about the APS? What, what functions does it fulfill? What community does it help build in physics? Well, I remember back when I was uh, a first year graduate student, I had done some research as an undergraduate uh, in my, at my undergraduate institution, which was uh, Stony Brook. And um, I uh, got the chance to give a, uh, one of these, uh, they, they call them 10 minute talks at the, uh, at the April APS meeting in Washington, DC. And, um, that was a big moment in my life that I got to give this talk and the, the, uh, APS meetings are kind of unique that way. Uh, they give a lot of opportunities for young people to, uh, to give talks, uh, that are, you know, that are not elaborate talks, but they're small talks on what they're doing. Um, and I always felt that it gave me a home uh, for my physics work. And so they had the journals where I could publish, they held the meetings where I could report my results. Um, and uh, things have evolved since then, but uh, it's always, it's just a sense of belonging, uh, that you belong to something. And um, and it, it's really, uh, you know, it's a great organization. There's so many people who are so passionate about the subject of physics. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's actually been a real privilege for me to, uh, to work in some leadership roles at the APS uh, and uh, try to help make things better and move things along. Uh, it's, uh, it's still very challenging to uh, you know, the, the, uh, the workforce in physics is not what you would call diverse by modern standards. It does not represent the society that supports it. Um, and um, there's a lot of work to do to try to improve that. I think there's a whole, uh, a whole range of people in society that don't participate in physics and physics uh, is, you know, is, is not better for that. Physics uh, needs more, more people with more opportunities and more diverse viewpoints. So that's a big challenge and a lot of what the APS is doing is, is to work in that area. Um, but just uh, especially giving young people, uh, you know, the opportunities and 
the, a place where they can hang their hat as a physicist, you know, and, and say, I belong in this place. Uh, and this is where my people are. It's, it's, a, it's, it's great to have that feeling. And I've always felt that way about the APS. Well, Bob, let's go all the way back to the beginning. Tell me about your family, your family background, where your parents came from. Um, yeah, well, I think one of the interesting things is my dad, um, I think it was during World War II when he was in the Navy, uh, learned about electronics. And, uh, and then after the war, he uh, uh, worked for aerospace companies on Long Island in New York. Uh, and uh, as an electronics technician, he never went to college. Um, and um, kind of worked his way up uh, and, uh, you know, learned lots of new things along the way, learned about computers and so forth. Um, he ended up working on uh, the what's called the Lunar Excursion mo Module, which was part of the Apollo project. Uh, it was built by, uh, by Grumman and he, when he worked for Grumman and he, he worked on that. Um, and um, so... And then when he, he had a hobby in the evenings, uh, he would go down in the basement and repair television sets for friends and family. Uh, and uh, so he had, you know, he had the vacuum tube tester and all of that stuff. And um, so I think I, I kind of uh, learned about electronics and stuff and got interested in that kind of stuff. Um, from him and what he was doing. And in fact, when I became in my teenage years, I got interested in amateur radio. And, uh, and he helped me a lot. So I learned enough electronics that I could get my license and so forth. And uh, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that. Um, but I think it also uh, gave me the opportunity to learn some technical things when I was pretty young. And uh, yeah, I think that probably gave me a lot of confidence that I could learn this kind of stuff, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, and of course, I was I was always good at math and science in school, so that uh, that helped too. Um, so it was I think that that was kind of a very formative experience uh, for me. And uh, you know, I, if he wasn't if he didn't do what he was doing, I think my life might be might be very different. <laughs> and where so, did you grow but, up? Where did you spend your childhood? Um, mostly in a place called Huntington, New York, on the North Shore of Long Island. Um, and so I we moved there when I was two years old. Um, and then when it came time to to go to college, um, I applied to. Uh, a few places, and I got into a few schools around the country, but, um, you know, it was a terrific thing back then. It was uh, the state of New York had, uh, first of all, um, Stony Brook, the, the school that I uh, ended up going to, it was called then State University of New York at Stony Brook. It was, um, um, they, they wanted to be the, the Berkeley of the East, they called it. And it was a it was a pretty new school. It had been established only a few years earlier. They were still building the buildings and stuff like crazy. And um, you know, it was it was quite a place. Um, and um, I remember that the tuition was one hundred and fifty dollars per semester. Um, and on top of that, I got something called the New York Region Scholarship, which paid the tuition. <laughs> so. I got to go to college basically for free, uh, which was great. And I lived at home most of the time, first three years, and I would commute. They had a fairly large uh, commuting uh, student population. And um, so I would commute. It was about 20, 25 minutes each way. Um, and uh, so I could live at home. It didn't cost me anything to, you know, I didn't have living expenses. Uh, other than buying myself lunch or whatever. Um, and um, they had, uh, you know, they had hired an amazing, uh, an amazing physics department. And, um, you know, so I, I took a physics course in high school 
and uh, I had a very good teacher, of course, and I, I had always enjoyed physics. I was always reading about physics, so I really loved it. And then I, when I got to college and I decided I would probably stick with it, I was, you know, had some other ideas, but, um, but uh, you know, the faculty at Stony Brook was, you know, they had hired this fellow, uh, C.N. Yang, who had a Nobel Prize, uh, and, uh, and, and, and so that kind of up the reputation of the place quite a bit. The faculty were excellent. They were really good teachers, who were, uh, really excellent physicists. And uh, I was very lucky to be able to go there. I thought it was, uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful experience for me. Bob, before college, was the draft something you needed to contend with? Um, during college, it was an issue. Yeah, it was. So I was, uh, they had a lottery when I was, uh, and, and uh, I came within about a dozen of the, of the, the cutoff for people that got drafted. Uh, so I was a little bit lucky that I didn't, uh, didn't end up going in that direction. But uh, yes, I mean, it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like I went to school because of that or anything. I went to school because I wanted to learn all this stuff and had all these opportunities. It was just, that was, that was something that could have derailed my education for a while, for sure. And, uh, yeah, but it didn't. But it was, uh, it was definitely an issue at the time. In fact, when I first went to Stony Brook, um, we would have, um, we would have uh, exams in the evening. And the first physics exam, we go into the physics lecture hall and everybody's sitting there starting to work on the exam and somebody called it a bomb scare. And this was a very common thing back then than uh, the years of Vietnam. And so we got moved to another lecture hall and they got us all started again. And of course there was another bomb scare. <laughs> and uh, they eventually, um, the professor said, okay, just go work on the exam uh, and you can collaborate, just whatever, just go. And I thought, you know, this was all new to me and I was, uh, you know, I was a little bit intimidated because, you know, I didn't really know where I stood relative to the other students in my class. And so this was, it was an eye opener. I sit, sat at a table with a bunch of the other students and started working on, on these problems. And I realized I was helping them a lot more than they were helping me. <laughs> and that was one of the first inklings I had that, hey, I'm going to be pretty successful even in the university. So uh, it was interesting. So that was, you know, I, I guess, you know, the, you know, the Vietnam situation had a little bit to do with that. But, uh, but mostly I, I really, uh, I really enjoyed uh, all my classes at, at Stony Brook. And in fact, all the other students, I, we used to have lab, uh, you know, lab courses in the evening and so forth. And, and being a commuter, I needed to have dinner. And so the students, I would help them with homework and they would feed me <laughs> dinners. Uh, was, uh, we had a lot of fun. It was very nice. You know, a lot of nice people I met there when we were students. Um, um, and then in my, in my sophomore year, very important thing happened that I, I got, uh, um, I asked, I, I was, uh, you know, I was working part-time also <laughs> during all this time. In fact, I had an interesting job then. I was working in, um, it was a, a liquor store uh, right uh, close to the Northport Long Island Railroad Station. And uh, I would work there in the evenings and people would get off the train and they would stop and buy their hooch on the way home. Uh, and mostly I would sit there and work on uh, my homework for uh, my college classes. Uh, and occasionally when the train would come, these people would come in and I'd have to take care of them. And, um, so was, but I wanted to, so I, but I asked my sophomore physics professor if, if there was any chances for employment at the, at the university. And he right away said, yeah, why don't, why don't you come down to the, to the uh, nuclear physics lab in the basement and we'll get you started. And so they gave me a job uh, and I worked for three years uh, part time uh, on uh, doing nuclear physics research. That's how I started doing nuclear physics. <laughs> Interesting. Bob, was Vietnam protest, civil war, civil rights protest, was that a big issue on campus when you were an undergraduate? 
Um, the yeah, at the beginning, like I said, the, yeah, these were all Vietnam uh, Vietnam protests. Um, people were really against the war, and Stony Brook had a very big uh, yeah, it was a big issue on on the campus at Stony Brook. And certainly, the first year or two when I was there. Um, civil rights, uh, not so much. That was earlier, I guess, and uh, didn't really. But you know, the, the 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 war was something that was very relevant to the students, uh, especially with you know because they were they were the age to be drafted and so forth. So it was a personal issue, um, and uh, yeah, so it was it was definitely there. I, by the time I became a senior, I think 1974, it, it you know was almost over, um, and uh, we we were pulling out at that point. Um, Nixon had already resigned. So, were there any opportunities between partnering uh, from Stony Brook and Brookhaven National Laboratory when you were an undergrad? Um, not so much for me. I worked on campus, um, but some of my friends uh, had jobs at Stone at, at Brookhaven, and in fact, I remember um, I was visiting them for some reason. I don't remember what, but we were in the there was like a lounge in the where the students uh, uh, could stay on uh, on on site at Brookhaven, and uh, I think things were easier then. You could you could just you know I could go there without having any status at the lab. But um, that I remember we were in that lounge and watched TV um, the night that Nixon resigned. It was like amazing. We watched his resignation uh, on TV at Brookhaven, so I remember that. But I didn't do any research at, at Brookhaven uh, then, but I had had friends in my physics classes who did. Bob, what were the big ideas in physics that captivated you as an undergraduate? Mm, as an undergraduate, not, you know, um, not so much as I just really... Uh, I just really enjoyed learning physics. It was a fascinating subject. I do remember that in my, I guess it was in my sophomore year, we had a course in electricity and magnetism. <clears throat> and um, it's, it's the book that I used for freshmen at Caltech many, many years later. Uh, called is the Berkeley, uh, um, Berkeley text on electricity and magnetism by Purcell. Um, and, um, I, and, and it, it had, uh, it had a really great treatment about how relativity, special relativity required, if you had electricity and you had special relativity, you would have to have magnetism, but they're, they're all related, right? And it had a really great treatment of this. And I thought that was that was so deep. <laughs> it was just amazing to me. And, you know, it's, uh, it's comparable to the ideas of, uh, you know, the standard model where you could unify electromagnetism and the weak, and weak force and weak interaction. Uh, and uh, so these are, these are very deep things in physics. And I, I just really thought that was wonderful. Um, and so that's, that's one of the kinds of things I, I remember. Um, the, you know, the, the cutting edge new stuff I was not so aware of. I mean, we were doing nuclear physics stuff in the basement, but it was um, it, it wasn't stuff that was really all very exciting. It was I mean, it was fun to do. But uh, is that to say that things like grand unification at Harvard or the Net November Revolution at SLAC, the building of the standard model, did that not really register with you so much as an undergraduate? Not so much. Um, not that I recall anyway, it was, you know, um, uh, stuff that, I mean, we probably were aware of it, you know, you read about it, Scientific American, things like that. But um, it was, you know, th these are pretty advanced uh, things for an undergraduate. And um, we pretty much stuck to the, the, you know, the basic material of the undergraduate curriculum and didn't have so much of that. I mean, there were colloquia and stuff, so I would occasionally go to colloquia on black holes and things. But um, yeah, I you know the, the standard model and all that, and the November Revolution. I guess that was 1974 or so. That was actually, I guess, when I was just getting to Princeton. So um, 
And I, I started being aware of that. I remember there was this fellow, Frank Wilczek there, and I knew Professor Gross as well, <laughs> who both got uh, Nobel Prizes many year, uh, years later, along with David Pollitzer, who I didn't know because he was a Harvard guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, I kind of knew these guys back then. It was interesting, um, and and um, you know also uh, Jim Peebles was teaching cosmology, and I would sit in on his lectures, and he was talking all about how you can um, you can uh, the formalism for writing down the angular distribution of the sky. Uh, which eventually became, you know, the power spectrum for cosmic microwave background. And I didn't know why we, why he was teaching us these things, but I thought it was interesting. Uh, and uh, and like I said, I had I ended up stumbled into this Stephen Hawking seminar. So there's, you know, lots of things like that that went on. It was fun. Um, and I got to work uh, in the in the nuclear physics lab again. Actually, you know, it was interesting when I went to Princeton. Um, they, they, they gave you a form and said, well, here's the fields of physics you could, uh, you could study and, you know, um, f you know, fill out the form and let us know what you think. And so I rated cosmology the highest and I don't know, a few other things and, and then eventually got down to nuclear physics. But of course they admitted me with the idea that I was going to work in the nuclear physics lab. <laughs> so that's where I ended up. <laughs> Uh, but I tried to learn. I often think, you know, I would have worked with uh, uh, Dennis Wilkins, David Wilkinson, uh, who uh, was a big man in, in cosmology. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know. It would have been interesting to maybe go in that direction if I could have. Maybe I, I needed to be a little more assertive. But I just, again, I, had, you know, you get it, just get into these places and you feel like, oh, my gosh, I, you know, do I really belong here? And you don't know yet, and so you don't. You, you know, it's hard to be very assertive. Other people have more confidence, I guess, but I didn't have so much then. And uh, but it all worked out uh, for the best uh, in the end. Bob, when it was time to think about graduate schools, what was attractive to you about Princeton? You know, I had no idea, and and it was very different then. Now, you know, the, the, the students all go around and visit all these places and. And you have parties for them, and you, know, you try to impress them with what a fun place it is. And um, it's uh, it wasn't like that then. Everything was just you, you mailed your applications, and you got an answer back. Um, and um, I got into you know good places: Caltech, Berkeley, uh, Princeton, MIT, Cornell. Um, and you know what what happened to me was I talked to my professors at um, Stony Brook and ask them their advice. And they all said, go to Princeton. <laughs> I'm not really sure why. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and there was a fellow one year ahead of me that graduated from Stony Brook that went to Princeton too. So I said, well, he seems to be surviving. I guess I can do it there. And, and also it wasn't so far away. Um, I think at that time I was still, yeah, I was, uh, I was, dating my, my future wife. So, you know, it was kind of had a relationship that would have been nice to stay uh, close to uh, Long Island. Um, and uh, so Princeton seemed, I don't know, seemed like the natural place. Tell me about getting to Princeton. How did it feel for you coming from a state school in New York? Uh, well, it was amazing because the, the uh, graduate students at, at that time lived up on a hill, a little bit off campus, up on a hill in a place called the Graduate College, which was like, um, it was this big Gothic style building with a big chapel in it. Uh, and it had a big carol on that they rang <laughs> Sunday mornings and stuff. And uh, it was, you know, it was a bizarre place. Uh, and I, I got a room in this place and it was beautiful. It had, you know, it had all the, all, all of these windows that looked out on, on a golf course. And, uh, I hear I hear they're tearing up the golf course to build something new. So I don't know, it won't be there forever. But it was it was amazing. And um, you know, um, all the other students were kind of in the same boat. I think everybody was a bit intimidated by the place because you know, um, and 
And what was interesting was the graduate students were, were completely separate from the undergraduates. I don't know if it's still like that, but the undergraduates were, um, you know, we always thought that they were sort of uh, upper class <laughs> kids and uh, they were all, uh, well, I guess they, they had just started admitting women uh, a few years before that. So, but it was, you know, very uh, dominated by males. Um, so the undergraduate population was like a, a whole foreign thing to us. They, they lived a completely different social life than the graduate students. But, um, you know, it was, uh, as far as, you know, I was settled into the physics department, then it was, uh, you know, it was great. I had lots of friends with the other students and um, really, I, I, you know, I, like I said, they, they stressed independent study, so I didn't, didn't have to take too many classes or did study things on my own for the exams and so forth. Um, the exams were very intimidating. I had uh, oral exams <laughs> as part of the uh, as part of the uh, general exams, and uh, yeah, I, I I didn't think they were quite fair the way the professors asked the questions, but <laughs> that, that was the way it was. <laughs> it was just more of the same thing of. Uh, feeling, oh my gosh, <laughs> this is difficult. But, you know, they, uh, it was, uh, I think it's actually, most of these places are very different now. And this is part of the whole thing about physics. And uh, when we talked about the APS before, is it's a much more friendly place. In fact, I was, you know, I've been, uh, last few years, I've been on the board of directors of the APS. And uh, it's lucky to sit there. So you go to these meetings, the board meetings with the president and the president elect and so forth. And recently, uh, one of the presidents was a fellow named uh, Jim Gates, uh, who's a, you know, fairly uh, uh, um, well known string theory person. Uh, and he's African American. And he sat at one meeting, and, and it, was when, it was when we were in the middle of a pandemic. He sat at one meeting, uh, we just had a whole discussion about APS and stuff, and he says, you know, the APS is such a different organization than it used to be. It's just not, it's not the APS I grew up with. It's completely different. And I think physics departments are like that, too. They're, they're much friendlier. Uh, they're much, I think it's a, it's a much different experience, uh, I think, than when when I was a student. Um, and that's good. That's good for physics. Um, and uh, I think we all would wish that it would uh, produce results in a more diverse workforce in physics. Uh, maybe that's still to come. But I think it's a necessary, uh, a necessary aspect of, of changing the culture in physics from what it was when I was a student, which was, I think, somewhat intimidating. Yeah. Bob, when you started graduate school, did you have a good idea of what kind of physics you wanted to focus on? Well, like I said, I thought I'd try to do something different like cosmology, <laughs> but they didn't cooperate. <laughs> um, and so I tried to learn things on my own and go to, go to classes and seminars. But um, but I, I was lucky. I, I, I think the, um, the, the physics I ended up working on in the, in the nuclear physics lab was very enjoyable. I got to meet some uh, amazing. There were there was a. It was kind of a special time there then. There was a large group of um, amazing visitors that were visiting the lab. Um, so two of them were uh, recent uh, Caltech PhDs. It turns out, um, Eric Adelberger, who ended up at the University of Washington, uh, and um, Art McDonald. Uh, a uh, uh, Canadian physicist, uh, and he was visiting also at the time. I got to meet these people when I was very young. Art McDonald won a Nobel Prize many years later for the neutrino experiment, right, in, in the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. Um, and uh, they both graduated from Caltech around 1969 or so. Uh, and then there was, uh, there was Hamish Robertson from uh, Michigan State. So they, these people were... Uh, very, very accomplished, uh, young at the time, experimental physicists. And so more than, even more than the professors, you know, we learned a lot from them. And uh, so it was a very productive, fertile environment uh, to grow up in. Um, you know, an interesting aspect of all of it was, was computers were just getting going at the time. In fact, when I was at Stony Brook, 
uh, we had computers uh, by Digital Equipment Corporation. And they were pretty nice computers at the time. And um, some of the other graduate students wired up little boxes with switches on them and, and, and programmed the computers. It was a, pro a game called Space Ward, and there would be uh, little spaceships uh, orbiting around the star, and you would shoot at each other. It was you were able to shoot. So it's like video games back in 1972. <laughs> you know, it was just it was there was no color. It was just green stuff. Um, and then when I went to to Princeton, it, we uh, we actually took a step back because they had a Xerox computer. And, uh, I don't think Xerox makes computers anymore for good reason. And this was amazing. So there were all these cards in them. And it was, I remember I actually fixed the thing once because it wasn't working. And I actually took the card out of the computer and I took a soldering iron and replaced the transistor on the card. I figured out somehow that the transistor was blown, put it back in and fixed the computer and started working. It's like, holy smokes, I actually fixed this thing. <laughs> Um, that, but that was a really different world. And then once I left, uh, once I left Princeton, things got very different. Uh, that was that was an anomaly. They were they were kind of backward in, in their use of computers. But but it was amazing because we were just learning how to use computers. They had a, Princeton had an IBM mainframe, IBM probably an IBM three hundred and sixty or something. And uh, most of the other students that did theory or cosmology or whatever would have these big decks of cards and they would do their computing on the big IBM machine. I didn't do very much of that, but it was very interesting. I mean, it was a really, it seems like a really different world than we had now. Hard to believe. Bob, who was your thesis advisor at Princeton? Uh, his name was uh, Jerry Garvey. Um, and uh, so he, we were, he was working on these experiments of, as, as usual, you know, there were these experiments to test the weak interaction. And there was some experiment somewhere, I, I think it was in Japan or something, that showed an anomalous result. And this happened just as I got to Princeton. And everybody got excited about this and inventing all kinds of new experiments to test to see whether it was right um, and so forth. And, and so that's what I got kind of swept up in. It was actually very exciting. It was very different from... Um, the uh, environment I had at Stony Brook. Stony Brook was, you know, they were just studying, measuring energy levels of nuclei, and, and you know, there wasn't too much excitement about it other than when you were done, you could publish a paper. Um, but when we, the stuff going on at Princeton was, there was real excitement, and there were all these visitors that were also all excited about this stuff. Um, and uh, it was just, uh, it was fun. It was, I really enjoyed that. So um, the uh, Garvey uh, decided after my second year that he was going to take a job as um, the director of the physics division at Argonne National Laboratory outside of Chicago. And uh, he, uh, he invited me to uh, uh, come there and work on my uh, thesis experiment there at Argonne. And uh, it was nice because they had more professional staff. They had real engineers, <laughs> and, uh, and and they had much better computers. Uh, and um, and you know they had people. Uh, they actually had staff to run the accelerator for you at Princeton. You did everything yourself. Middle of the night, you would be you know taking things out of the middle of this big cyclotron magnet. Actually. Very hazardous. <laughs> I don't think it should have been done that way, but that's the way we did things. Um, and uh, so he uh, invited me to go to Argonne. I moved out to Argonne uh, and spent uh, four years there. It took uh, you know, took about two and a half, three years to finish the experiment. We had to build it first, and uh, we used the accelerator in the basement. And um, so uh, yeah, so I was there four years. And the Chicago weather, which is normally in the winter, not very nice, uh, was very extreme those four years, it turned out. <laughs> it was, uh, I, I started doing some work in Los Alamos uh, using the uh, 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 Maison physics facility there. And I remember once I, uh, I, I went to the airport and there was all this, it was, uh, the, you know, the roads were covered with you know, inches thick of ice. And I came back like three weeks later, 
And the same ice was there, only there were ruts where the car tires were going. <laughs> it was it just stayed cold. Um, and so, of course, at, uh, at, in 1980, when I uh, was approached for a, a position at Caltech, that sounded sounded very good. Uh, Chicago winter was was really getting to me. <laughs> what were the results uh, of your thesis work? So we tested. Uh, it was in um, um, it was beta decay. So it was studying the weak interaction. So there's uh, boron eight and lithium eight are two. Uh, they're called mirror nuclei. They're mirrors of each other. If you turn all the protons into neutrons and vice versa, uh, they both decay to beryllium eight by uh, emitting uh, a beta particle and uh, neutrino. And we would study, and then the, 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 uh, it, in brilliant eight, there would be alpha particles embedded. And we studied the uh, correlation between the beta particles and the alpha particles. And you compare it between the electron decay and the positron decay. And the prediction was there was something, a variation of the weak interaction known as second class currents. Uh, and if you and, and this this is what this Japanese experiment I mentioned earlier had they had seen second class currents and that's what everybody was excited about. So we were looking for these second class currents in this experiment, but it turned out the experiment uh, showed exactly what you would expect from the standard standard model of the weak interaction. So we didn't see anything abnormal, but it was a really nice experiment. <laughs> it was fun to do. What were the circumstances of you joining the faculty at Caltech? Um, you know, uh, well, I mean, it, it kind of started, I was, you know, there, so at, at Argonne, there was the uh, graduate student office where there were like maybe seven or eight desks where graduate students would sit. That's, that was your place. And, uh, most of them, they were all University of Chicago students. I was from Princeton. I was uh, the outlier. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I just came into the office one day. And I, in those days, we didn't have email. You had these little yellow message uh, slips. <laughs> and I got this message to call this guy, Professor Coonan at Caltech, and left a number. And so I called him up. And he asked if I'd be interested in a, a faculty position at Caltech. Hmm. <laughs> sure, I think so. <laughs> so I, I remember I went out for a visit, and they, you know, they uh, they took me around. And I talked to lots of people. I didn't really know too much about what was uh, what, it, you know. That these days, I think people are much more aware when they interview for a job, what it's about. Do you remember who met, met you, who was, who, was, hmm? uh, who was taking you around on that initial visit? I don't remember for sure. I guess this guy Coonan was uh, involved. Uh, so he was a nuclear theorist that I hadn't heard of because he didn't work in the area that I worked in, but uh, we ended up later becoming good friends. And, uh, we still are. Um, and, but... Um, uh, I don't remember exactly, uh, and I remember giving a seminar, uh, and that it seemed to go pretty easily. I'm kind of I was used to even at Argonne, there were there were people like you know John Schiffer and Jerry Garvey, and they they would always you know if you gave a talk they would you know they would challenge you. I mean, put it that way, <laughs> and this was like kind of kind of a walk in the park they seemed to go oh, they seemed to think it was okay and uh they didn't give me too much of a bad time so well, okay well i guess that went okay um so um next thing i know i got an offer and uh, uh i you know the only other thing i had cooking so a good friend of mine from graduate school who graduated with jerry garvey as well but he went to los alamos um uh, Afterwards, he, you know, he went to Argonne with us for a while as a postdoc, but then he went to Los Alamos. And he was at Los Alamos, and he got the, uh, his boss to uh, invite me to uh, interview at Los Alamos for a job. So I go out there. It's actually very interesting because the guy, his boss, who was the director of the physics division in Los Alamos, was, was a fellow named Jay Keyworth. He was a nuclear physicist. Uh, and this is 1980, 
Okay. And if you fast forward two years to 1982, Jay Keyworth was uh, Ronald Reagan's science advisor, uh, pushing the uh, Strategic Defense Initiative, otherwise known as Star Wars. Right. <laughs> it's, but I sat with this guy, and he's trying to talk me into going to Los Alamos. Uh, it was a very interesting conversation. Um, but, you know, in the end, I really felt Caltech had a much stronger draw. Uh, they were offering me, uh, a, a, by modern standards, a pittance in the startup sal startup uh, package. I think it was thirty five thousand dollars. You know, they spent most of it on an oscilloscope. <laughs> um, and um, what was interesting was, I, you know, um, the lab, the people at Argonne, and my PhD advisor did not want me to take this job hmm. at, at Caltech. They didn't want me. And, you know, I think part of the reason was, uh, you know, Caltech wanted to hire me because the experimental nuclear physics faculty was getting pretty long in the tooth. And they wanted to bring somebody new in, which is good. Uh, but being that they had been long in the tooth and, and all these people had been there for a long time, um, they were uh, a, a lot of the equipment was very outdated. Talk about computers. They did not have a computer in the nuclear physics lab. Uh, and uh, when I went there and I told you that I had I had I had nice computers when I was an undergraduate back in Stony Brook uh, eight years earlier. And there was no computer in the lab. It was amazing. Um, and um, all the you know, oscilloscopes were these really old, uh, kind of like what you would, what, what I would find back then in, in under, they would be relegated to undergraduate laboratories for undergrads to use because they weren't state of the art oscilloscopes. So, uh, you know, but they had just convinced the NSF to build a new accelerator. Uh, and so they had a new accelerator that was uh, under construction when I went there. And uh, so I felt like, you know, this was a real challenge to try and, uh, you know, build a modern, uh, a modern laboratory doing physics in, in, in this environment where these, these old guys thought they, the old way was the good way. It was kind of interesting. Um, and uh, so to back up a little, I mean, the, the lab, the Kellogg lab, uh, gained a lot of notoriety. Uh, their, 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 their hallmark was studying what's called nuclear astrophysics, where you measure nuclear reactions in the laboratory that are relevant to the production of elements in stars. So, you know, the Big Bang produces hydrogen and helium and pretty much nothing else. And everything else, the carbon, the oxygen, uh, the, the iron that makes steel, <laughs> everything, uh, is made in stars and figuring out how that all happens was a big deal. And Willie Fowler uh, was uh, uh, a you know an icon in that business, um, and uh, and he had a postdoc. This was all before I got there. He had a postdoc named John Bacall, who was the guy that calculated the solar neutrino flux, uh, and so the place was famous for this nuclear astrophysics stuff. Um, and uh, so that was kind of the, the, the scene I walked into. Uh, and um, I still, just as a little aside, I still remember 1983. I, I used to wake up, you know, we had a house up in Altadena. And I used to wake up in the morning and uh, make coffee and listen to the radio, uh, listen to some classical music. And, of course, the news would come on. And I still remember the day in October of, uh, of 1983 when the news came on and they announced that Willie Fowler had the Nobel Prize. There's this guy right in the lap where I work. He got the Nobel Prize. And boy, that was, that was quite a day. That was quite a day, I'll tell you. Uh, it was amazing. Um, so um, anyway, uh, back at the ranch, so they had this new accelerator and um, as, as I mentioned earlier, there was this kind of new technique that people had been developing called accelerator mass spectrometry, where you use an accelerator like that as a mass spectrometer. 
And that was one of the possible future uses of this thing. Um, I mean, the guys there thought they were going to do nuclear astrophysics, more nuclear astrophysics, and that's fine. Um, but um, there was this experiment uh, um, at uh, Stanford by this guy, Bill Fairbank, uh, that seemed to show that there were uh, fractional charges in a material called Niobe. So, you know, in the very early days, Millikan, who was, you know, famous for Caltech, uh, first president, I guess, and uh, he established that all charge is quantized in units of the electron charge. And then, um, you know, Mary Gell-Mann and another guy named George Sly came up with this idea of, the, of these quarks as that they could explain that the, the uh, array of particles and their and relationships by saying that the protons and neutrons and other elementary particles are made of these things called quarks. And these quarks had to have fractional charges and multiples of one third of the charge that Millikan found. So, um, and, and this guy at Stanford seemed to be seeing fractional charges in this experiment with uh, superconducting niobium spheres. Um, so I had the idea that, well, uh, we could use the technique of accelerator mass spectrometry, but we would use an ion beam to basically uh, um, disassemble niobium, pieces of niobium into, into atoms. It would, just, it would just kick atoms off the surface. And then you would take any, any charged objects that came off the surface and run them through the accelerator system. And if it were a completely electrostatic system with no magnetic fields, um, it would be able to uh, determine the charge without regard for the mass of the, of the particle, since we didn't know what the mass was going to be. And so we started this experiment, and this was kind of the first thing I did at Caltech. And um, it, uh, you know, it was it was interesting. It was a fun experiment. So it was kind of challenging. I had a graduate student and some postdocs that helped me, uh, and. Um, we did the experiment and on niobium and didn't see anything. And so then we did some other experiments. I, I, I got to know some of the people in um, the geology department, geochemists. Um, one was uh, Jerry Wasserberg, who was a wonderful scientist, uh, and some others. And, and so they gave me meteorite samples and said, well, let's look at meteorites. <laughs> and so we just started doing random things like that. But one of the interesting stories was the, um, the student that searched for these fractional charges on the, on the experiment uh, got to do his, his, he wrote a thesis and he had to do his oral exam for the thesis defense. And so uh, they set up a committee uh, like they usually do. And on his committee, he was privileged to have Dick Feynman as a member of his committee. All right. And so this was like, oh, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, so uh, we go in and the student starts talking, describing the experiment. And Feynman starts asking kind of kind of random questions. They weren't very good questions. And, uh, it was uh, it was clear he had not even read the thesis. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I should have known because even for my PhD defense. That was something I learned in the in the room of the oral exam. Was none of these people actually read the thing? <laughs> anyway, uh, what was really interesting was Feynman, as time went on, started asking the questions. Got better and better and better. <laughs> they got to be pretty good. <laughs> so you get to the point where, gee, uh, you know. Hopefully he doesn't find something that we overlooked or something that would be very embarrassing, right? Uh, not, not, well, not only bad for the student, but it would probably end my career, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, in the end, uh, all went well. And I still remember to this day, he came up to me afterwards and complimented me on this. This was a, a clever experiment and he really liked it. Um, and that was, that meant a lot at the time. That was really kind of interesting. And so that night I went with the student and his, and his wife and my wife went to, uh, there used to be a restaurant in Pasadena called the Chronicle. Uh, it was very, uh, you know, very continental kind of 
play, but it was so we went for a fancy dinner and I've never had gone there before and, <laughs> and uh, celebrated. So that was a really interesting. Uh, I like these uh, sort of deployment stories. There's a lot of those. It's interesting. He's quite a guy. Bob, those initial misgivings from uh, people at Argonne, your thesis advisor, about not taking the job at Cal Caltech. Yeah. How had that aged by the time you were sort of a faculty member for a couple of years? Were you glad you, you, you joined the faculty at Caltech? I was having a great time. Yeah, actually, it was going very well. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in, uh, when I got reviewed after three years or so, I think the, the problem was I, they thought I was doing too many things, <laughs> uh, which was probably true. Um, and so I had to, you know, kind of restructure my research program a little bit. But I was just having so much fun and, you know, being among all of these people, um, you know, Willie Fowler, uh, Dick Feynman, Murray Gilman, you know, people like Murray Gilman and George Swig was there at the time too. They were so, they were so supportive of this court search thing because they thought, you know, it was a problem then because nobody really understood that, you know, we, we hadn't been living very long with the idea that a well, proton is made up of quarks, but you can't take the quarks out. <laughs> nobody's ever, nobody's ever seen the quark. Uh, and so, um, I think they thought this was going to be the, the, um, the, the thing that really, uh, maybe, maybe the quirks are really there. And this guy Fairbank found the magic formula and maybe this guy McEwen's going <laughs> to, going to verify it. I don't know. So it, it, everybody was very supportive. And so it was, it was, uh, very nice. Uh, and, um, the Kellogg lab was, was actually great. There was. A lot it was a lot of fun where um it was an annual uh retreat to uh, i think caltech sold it now but there used to be uh in uh east of san diego in a place called fullerton there was a, a ranch called the capra ranch and frank capra had uh was a caltech alum and had left this ranch to caltech and people were able to use it for retreats and all kinds of it was not too far from Palomar, so the, the astronomers used it a lot. And we would have an annual Kellogg retreat there. Um, and uh, we would take our group of graduate students to the Athenaeum on, what, for lunch on Fridays. Um, and uh, it was just uh, it was just a great environment, and I really enjoyed it. It was great. After that review where you were told that you might be doing too much, did you prioritize? Did you whittle down what was most important to you? Yeah, well, a lot of the stuff was collaborating with other faculty. And I just sort of had to tell some of them that I was going to have to focus on certain things. And yeah, it was a little bit difficult, but I think all it was for the best. Um, so, yeah, it was it was fine. And. I, I think, you know, then we hired another assistant professor a couple of years later. Uh, and, uh, you know, so things, uh, and we had lots of visitors coming all the time. Um, in fact, really interesting, uh, we, we used to have every winter, uh, Hans Bethe, who was one of the, you know, fathers of nuclear physics. Uh, and he got, a, he got a Nobel Prize, I think, in, 1967 or something. He was the head of theory of Los Alamos, and Dick Feynman worked under him in Los Alamos during the Manhattan Project. He was a big man in um, in, in the Manhattan Project, uh, and and he used to come. He was like a he was a buddy of Willie Fowler's, so he would come in the winter, and he would bring his friend uh, from Stony Brook, Jerry Brown. Hans Beta was from Cornell. And they would you know it was cold in New York, so they came to Pasadena in January. And um, Hans Beta, the joke was he loved explosions because, you know, ever since the Manhattan Project. But he, um, there was a problem for many years uh, that uh, it was thought that a lot of the way, uh, a lot of the heavy elements were made in the explosion of very heavy stars called uh, supernovae, type 2 supernovae. And uh, Hans Beta and Jerry Brown, uh, 
thought this was a problem we should be able to solve. Uh, and they, they, you know, they were, they were old school. They sat down with a piece of paper and started working on equations. They thought they could make these stars explode. And um, they never could. It, was, it always failed. It turned out many years later that the key to making these things explode is, uh, is three-dimensional turbulence that you can't, uh, do analytically in a one-dimensional model like they were trying to do. So it's uh, to make the star explode, you really need a numerical simulation, very complex uh, 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 turbulence in it. But they thought they should be able to make this thing explode. So they, they would come every winter and work on this. And actually, they came up with an idea that uh, when, when, when you know, LIGO was getting traction, um, they came up with the idea that, gee, maybe there are binary neutron stars, and maybe there's a lot of them, we don't know. And so they started thinking about, well, maybe there's gravitational waves from binary neutron stars. And I think, I'm not sure they had the very first idea, but they had early glimpses of what became true uh, many decades later. It's kind of interesting. Um, but it was, uh, it was great having them visit uh, every winter. Um, and uh, they were very, uh, very smart people, and uh, it, was, it was very inspiring to be around them. Bob, I'm curious if you ever had interactions with Murph Goldberger, either from your graduate school days at Princeton or when he was Caltech president. Yeah, when I, uh, <laughs> it's interesting, yeah. So when I decided to go to Argonne from Princeton, he was the department chair. Mm -hmm. And I still remember I had to go into his office and uh, there was some form he had to sign for me to be able to go to Argonne and still be a, uh, a Princeton student, but not in residence at Princeton. At Princeton. And uh, I, don't, I don't remember what he said. He made some offhand remarks. I, I don't think he particularly like this idea. He probably being department chair, he's probably not happy that this guy Garvey was leaving in the first place. And now he's taking students with him. You know, I, I don't really know. I'm kind of connecting the dots, but he seemed not too happy about the situation. <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, who knows? I show up a few years later as an assistant professor and Murph Goldberger is the president of Caltech. <laughs> um, and I guess I can't remember if he remembered me, might have. I can't remember, but, you know, uh, it's Caltech's a small place, so you get to know the president a little bit. Um, and uh, he was a very impressive, a very impressive guy. And, uh, you know, I didn't, didn't interact with him too much. I interacted more. You know, we had the division chair at the time was uh, Robbie Boat, and I interacted more with him. Uh, and... Uh, he helped me with you know the startup package and things like that, getting started. And then he became provost and stuff later. Um, but uh, there's a lot of other a lot of other things. Yeah, Bob, going through the tenure process and coming out the other side, did that influence your research at all? The kinds of things that you felt you could be able to work on? You know, no, I don't think so. I. Um, I mean, other, other, other than the sort of mid-course correction of trying to focus more, uh, other than that, um, I, I pretty much did what I thought was important. And, you know, I didn't know if I was going to, you know, when I went to Caltech, I didn't know that I, if I was going to get tenure or not. You know, I, I had no idea. Um, and, you know, I, I, but I didn't really conduct myself in a way that I thought would get tenure. I, I just did what I, what I wanted to do, what I thought was good physics, good, good research. Um, tried to do well at teaching, but you know, that, that, that in those days anyway, didn't count as much. Um, and, uh, but I enjoyed the teaching. It's, you know, it's, as anyone at Caltech will tell you, teaching Caltech students is, is a real pleasure. And uh, I really enjoyed that part of the job. Um, and then, of course, you know, the graduate students, I had 14 graduate students over the years, PhDs, uh, and uh, 
I don't know, something like 30 postdocs uh, came through and worked with me. Um, so it was uh, it's just a lot of great people. You know, like everything else, it's the interactions with the other people that really make it all worthwhile. And if you don't have that, then, you know, the physics is great. But, you know, it's, what makes it fun is, is really interacting with people and doing the physics with people. So um, I really, I really enjoyed it. Bob, when did you start to get involved with advisory work for national laboratories? When did that begin for you? Oh, yeah. Too early. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was like committees at Caltech. I got I got onto committees too early, too, and, uh, before I really was prepared. Anyway, um, yeah, uh, you know, in the 80s, I... Um, in Los Alamos. Well, my Jerry Garvey went from Argonne to Los Alamos and became the director of the Maison Physics Facility. And I was on their program committee. Uh, I also uh, got to be on, on uh, you know, committees for other accelerators. I, you know, and I, you know, even, you know, the, there's a thing called the Nuclear Science Advisory Committee which advises DOE and NSF on nuclear science. And um, they do something called a long range plan every you know, six or seven years or so. In 1983, I was pretty, pretty junior then, and they, they were doing one of these long range plans in a place called Wells College, New York. And they asked me uh, to go and be part of this process which was real eye opener because, you know, all the, all the big wigs in nuclear physics were there uh, arguing about the future of the field. Uh, and there I was, <laughs> it was like amazing. Um, so yeah, I don't know, they, uh, and, and you know, um, like I say, I thought it was too early, but you know, these days um, there's a, a big push everywhere in academia and at labs to include early career people in all of these kinds of processes um, to get their perspective. And um, I think it's valuable. Um, and um, the problem, of course, is these people also need to get stay focused on their research. It's, you know, it's hard to learn uh, learn, learn to do science and then go off and do committees and things. But, um, so it wasn't so common when I was young, but I seem to, people seem to, uh, ask me to do things. And of course you always say yes, <laughs> you don't say no. Um, and, uh, so it's, I don't know, I, I it was valuable. I learned things. I, I met people, um, when, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the uh, guy who became the chair of this NSAC in the 90s was somebody I worked with and, and was on committees with in the 80s even, named Ernie Moniz, who became the Secretary of Energy uh, back in the Obama administration. NSAC is Nuclear Science Advisory Committee? That's right. What is its mission? What is it designed to do? To, to advise DOE and NSF on nuclear physics and nuclear science. Yeah. But this is all. This is this has nothing to do with um, the the nuclear uh, uh, regulatory uh, no, committee. That's completely separate. Yeah. yeah that's that's uh, regulating uh, safety of nuclear reactors. Yeah. That's separate. Uh, this is really to uh, you know. There's the set of uh, national laboratories that all have nuclear physics programs and all these professors at these universities doing nuclear physics at these facilities. Um, and if you have to, somebody has to decide which of these facilities get upgraded and which facilities to build in the future. Um, so, you know, high energy physics has something called HEPAP, high energy physics advisory panel, you know, then they were the ones that, that first said we should build the SSC. <laughs> um, and so uh, it's a, um, the Department of Energy has, uh, uh, you know, these different programs in, in uh, the Office of Science, and each program has an advisory committee. And so that's, that's the process. And it was, it was in place back in the early 80s. Um, and I got, you know, I got, you know, roped into it pretty early, uh, uh, which was fine. Uh, and, 
you sort of, you know, you certainly learn a lot and you certainly meet a lot of people that way. So it was interesting. What was some of your interactions early on with Jefferson Lab that might have foreshadowed your decision ultimately to join the lab? Oh, gee. So, um, you know, before the lab was built, uh, the, um, uh, they, they were trying to, um, they were running study groups in the summer. Um, this was in the early eighties and uh, mid eighties anyway. And I would go there with um, a graduate student and a postdoc and we would spend a few weeks and we would re read all these papers that the theorists were writing on spin dependence, uh, <laughs> electron scattering. And, and we would uh, come up with ideas for experiments and write them up and they would go into reports to the, to the, um, uh, to the lab, uh, before anything was built. It was amazing. Um, and, um, so then, and then there was, uh, the very first program advisory committee meeting to decide on the priorities of the program for the future accelerator as it was being built in 1988. And I remember I was on that committee. Uh, Ernie Moniz was on that committee. Uh, and, uh, it was, uh, it was really, uh, that was a very interesting exercise. Um, so, and what, um, Bob, what were the objectives of the accelerator and why was this something that was not being thought of at one of the extant national labs? Yeah. So this was, it was an interesting story. They, um, so back in the late seventies, um, the NSAC process was not so formal then, but they did write a report. And they recommended um, an electron accelerator. Um, they didn't specify the energy, but I think it had, they anticipated it, it would be like one GeV. Uh, and um, the main feature of this accelerator was that the beam would be continuous. At the time you had at Stanford uh, and, uh, and you also had an MIT electron accelerators and around the world place also. Uh, and all these electron accelerators uh, were pulsed. And um, the, the reason is <laughs> uh, they, um, they are, um, they're, they're basically they're waveguides that contain uh, radio frequency energy. Um, and they're made of copper. And the uh, radio frequency energy is so high uh, that if you just let them run, it would melt the copper, even even with the water cooling and everything you can do to keep the copper from melting. You would melt the copper. Okay, there's just too much power. The, too much power dissipated in the copper. Copper is a good conductor, but the resistance is not zero. Um, and so you pulse the machine. You you build up. You know, you, you turn on the RF power for only a short amount of time, and turn it off again before the before the copper melts. And uh, so the beams are pulsed. And when the beams are pulsed, that really limits what you can do in terms of experiments, um, because all the electrons come at once and, you know, it's kind of a mess. It, it just makes it difficult. And it was realized that if you could spread the beam out continuously, uh, and there were ideas for how to do this, but, uh, you know, and that this would be, this would enable a whole generation of new experiments. That was the idea in the late seventies. And, um, so, uh, then they had a competition, uh, for this accelerator. <laughs> um, MIT wanted to build it. Argonne wanted to build it. Uh, I think the national bureau of standards wanted to build it, what became NIST and, um, the university of Virginia, wanted to build it. There was a couple of people at University of Virginia and they had a bright young guy there um, uh, and they came up with a design. They had a, they had a committee that went around. Uh, the chair of the committee was a man named Alan Bromley who became science advisor under, I believe, Bush the first. Uh, and they decided that this would go to Virginia. And uh, part of the reasoning was, well, the Southeast needed a facility and all these other places already had things. Uh, kind of crazy, but that's what happened. Um, and then they hired a guy from Berkeley 
uh, who was a you know uh, kind of what you might call a professional accelerator builder. These people at Virginia were all, were amateurs, <laughs> but they had an idea, and, and the idea was that you would you know you would pile up the pulses in a ring and stretch them out, and then let them come out. Okay, it was kind of brute force, simple idea, um, and that's that was what won the competition. Um, so this, they got this guy, uh, his name is Herman Grunder, to come uh, to uh, Virginia to build this accelerator. And he hired some of, some of his people that he, he was originally Swiss, and he hired some of these Swiss guys and stuff from Switzerland and that knew how to build accelerators. And they got enamored with a new idea that was being worked on at Cornell, which was, okay, the way you fix this problem of the copper melting is you make these things superconducting, <laughs> zero resistance. <laughs> well, this was a very uh, you know new thing, and nobody had ever built anything like this before. And this guy uh, Grunder made a remarkable decision. Uh, okay, we're going to go with with the new technology, and that and this was this was a time you know <laughs> in the 1980s when the lab director could tell the Department of Energy what he wanted to do. <laughs> These days, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> um, and he, you know, they were so desperate to have this professional guy build this accelerator there that they relented and said, okay. And so he changed the whole design of, <laughs> that had won the competition. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and he built it. And it was a remarkable success. Um, but I was involved early on uh, and um, in, in the program, in designing experiments. I wasn't really working that. I, actually, I did for a while work to be um, to help them build one of the uh, experimental uh, devices. Uh, which was a big superconducting toroid, and I got them started on building that that project. Um, but uh, but I I had other priorities in my own research that did not involve that lab, and so I started working more at Bates Accelerator at MIT, uh, and then at uh, at SLAC, uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator. And we were working also at the Daisy Laboratory in Hamburg, Germany. And so I wasn't too, uh, you know, I wasn't too involved uh, after a while in, in the, the lab in Virginia. Uh, along the way, they renamed it to be Jefferson Lab or Thomas Jefferson National Accelerator Facility. It wasn't originally called that. Um, I, you know, for a while I was, uh, I was ahead of their user group and things like that, but I kind of, you know, started going my own way, doing other things. And, um, so, you know, um, but, you know, I always, you know, kept, was surprised at what was going on there. Um, I just didn't, you know, particularly, uh, participate in it very much myself. Um, there was one experiment that one of my former postdocs um, set set up there that I participated in um, for a while, um, so I had some relationship with the lab. Um, but uh, in the mid two thousands, I guess it was, yeah, I was on advisory committee at Fermilab, uh, and uh, their, their their physics advisory committee. Uh, that decides, you know, which experiments run for me that, right? Uh, so I was doing that for a few years, and I got to know the associate laboratory director, a fellow named Hugh Montgomery. Um, and uh, in um, probably 2008 or so, uh, he was offered the... Um, directorship of Jefferson Lab. So he became the Jefferson Lab director. And uh, he had a number two man there. Uh, and he, they, you know, I think they weren't getting along or something. And, uh, you know, an email came out that the number two man had resigned. And so I, we were working in China at the time on neutrinos. And a friend of mine, you know, we were chatting, uh, 
And uh, I said, gee, that's probably a pretty interesting job now. You could go there and because the, with the new director, they always had accelerator people in charge of that lab. And, and he was uh, he was an experimental physicist. In fact, he was a particle physicist, not even a nuclear physicist. Um, but and and he was you know he was actually uh, he was a very personable guy. Uh, I, I enjoyed meeting him and interacting with him at Fermi. And he uh, so uh, my friend sent him an email and said, "Hey, why don't you why don't you see if Bob wants to take this job?" <laughs> so next thing I know, I hear from him, and uh, it took a took the better part of a year to get it all negotiated and I wanted to have a faculty position at the College of William and Mary. Um, that means you have to convince the faculty at William and Mary that this is a good idea. So, you know, all these things, especially when you when get into that situation, take time. Um, and uh, Caltech made a good effort for, to try and convince me to stay and I can't say they did anything wrong. <laughs> um, but uh, it seemed like maybe it was time for a change. Uh, maybe it was just, you know, it's like, you know, you, you do what your PhD advisor did. <laughs> At some point, you leave the university and go and direct a lab or something. So I did it, and it was a bit of a culture shock at the beginning because, you know, all the DOE stuff was a lot more it was you know it was much different environment than being at caltech bob did you give uh, up your tenure or did you do like a, a sort of leave of absence tryout period yeah they, they were very nice to me they gave me two years leave of absence um and i really appreciated that because i wasn't sure <laughs> about this at all but they were very very accommodating and uh, i appreciated that very much um and so um but, um, you know, we were there and uh, things were going okay, I guess. Uh, it was difficult at first, but it was going okay. And there were aspects of the job I really enjoyed. I mean, uh, it was really helping people get projects started. And, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was very rewarding that way. Um, and so... Um, so I decided to stay there and, and, you know, I was still doing neutrino physics in China for a few years. Um, but then, you know, I was, I was funded by the National Science Foundation and, um, you know, they, it was, it was a little too much for them to fund the research project of somebody that was deputy director of a Department of Energy lab. Uh, and uh, it just didn't fit their portfolio <laughs> let's put it that way uh and so they didn't they really didn't want to fund it anymore so i, I had to kind of stop doing research um and i had kind of a principle when i went to the lab and tried to maintain was that i wanted to not have any conflicts of interest so you know you might say well why don't you just start doing research at the lab there it would have been easy right it's just down the street and that's true i could have done that but i I really wanted to maintain my neutrality with the, you know, there's 1500 users that come and work at the lab. And uh, I, I thought it was really important to not take sides. Uh, and um, that's just the way I operated when I was there. So I didn't, so I couldn't continue doing new neutrino research because then NSF didn't want to fund me. And then I, you know, and, and uh, I didn't want to, uh, get into a situation at the lab where I felt like I would have conflict of interest. So, uh, so I just, uh, you know, I, I stopped doing my own research and uh, just concentrated on the administrative work. Um, but I enjoyed, uh, I, you know, I enjoyed uh, being on the faculty at the College of William and Mary. They were very friendly to me and they really appreciated um, my presence there when I would come to the, I, would ha I had an office and so forth, and I would come attend seminars and colloquia and uh, come to faculty meetings, and they, they seemed to really appreciate that I would participate in, in their academic life there. Um, so it was, it was actually turned out quite nice. It was, it was good. Um, then, you know, I got to be, uh, Heading towards 70 years old and the pandemic hit, <laughs> that kind of shook everything up. 
we we had bought a place here in California and wanted to live out here, so decided to take retirement. Bob, were you able to keep up uh, an active research agenda when you joined Jefferson Lab, or was this your responsibilities really more on the administrative side at that point? Well, I still had my um, uh, this this experiment in China, uh, this uh, neutrino experiment in China was was just getting going. We, we uh, it started up. We were still constructing it in 2010 when I left. In fact, I had a whole team of you know better part of a dozen people at Caltech that continued to work on this stuff while I was in Virginia, uh, and the NSF continued to pay them. Uh, and uh, well, a combination of NSF and and the DOE project that was building the experiment, um, and so um, the the thing just kept going, and I would be you know I was in constant contact with them, obviously, uh, and uh, going back and forth to China, um, and so uh, and then it was in uh, in uh, it was Christmas Day, 2011, when the experiment started taking data. And uh, it was one of these nice things. In March of 2012, uh, we were able, the, the result was so clear in, in the data that we took. We were able to write a paper and publish very quickly. And it was a very, I mean, it was very successful. Um, it was, you know, uh, we beat all the, there were several other experiments around the world that were competing with us and, with us, and we, we beat them all to it. And uh, got a very nice physics result that surprised everybody. That, that we were, it, it was really thought that this angle we were going to try to measure was very small and it's going to be hard to measure. And it turned out to be just below the previous limits from previous experiments. So it actually was very easy for us to make a very definitive measurement very quickly. So it was, it was very exciting, actually. It was a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, that experiment continued to run until you know probably 2020 or so i didn't you know around 2014 or so when my funding cut out i uh, i kind of drifted away from it you know, that was that was it for my research career at that point <laughs> and then of course covid happens then covid happened and uh you know sitting in my house in virginia uh, working from home, <clears throat> I'm going, we had the house out here in California already. I said, gee, we should be in California. And, uh, and, 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 and of course, everything changed at the lab. They, they all, all of a sudden decided it was very attractive to be able to pay people in other states because you could attract people to work remotely that you wouldn't otherwise be able to hire. So it was, they, you know, they viewed this as an opportunity like many businesses do. And so I got to be able to work from California <laughs> uh, remotely, um, and um, you know it was it was great. I mean, part of the idea was we had uh, we had we had two children, a son and a daughter, that live in the Bay Area here, and so we wanted to kind of eventually retire up here. Um, but yeah, the pandemic kind of precipitated the whole thing, got us moving on. When did you buy the house? 2019. Ah, so that was that <laughs> yeah, was always was, the retirement plan. Yeah, but I figured it was three or four years, and I was talking to the director. I said, you know, I'm not going to do this too much longer. And I said, I told him, I said, now that I bought the house, you know, the writing's on the wall. So he knew it was coming. Um, but then once we, you know, once 2020 hit the pandemic, and you know, the whole idea was we would go back and forth a lot, you know, and we'd have a house on each coast and. It, you couldn't travel, it couldn't, you know, it wasn't working so well. We were stuck in Virginia. So we said, okay, let's just sell that place and we'll be stuck in California. Uh, and the lab cooperated because they set up a, you know, they have to do some paperwork with the state of California to be able to pay me and so on. But they did it because uh, they were doing it for other people. They had 11 other states that they were working on. And uh, so, yeah, boom, there I was. Um, and so, as I said, I have... I have emeritus status at the lab and at College of William and Mary. And so I still have contact with the lab a lot. And I'm starting up with Berkeley. I'm going to go down to Berkeley. Uh, and uh, in fact, the person who signed me up at Berkeley was one of my ex graduate students, my PhD student. Oh, that's great. <laughs> has been at the lab here for uh, quite a while now. 
So I have I have all these ex students all over the place. They <laughs> run into them everywhere. It's great. Well, Bob, we'll bring this. We'll bring the story right up to the present. What are you interested in? What do you want to do with your new affiliation at Berkeley? Oh, well, you know, I don't think I'm going to actually participate in research very much uh, as just, um, you know, try to uh, keep up with things, go to seminars, um, maybe hopefully once in a while, maybe might have uh, something useful to say to them that they would find uh, helpful. Uh, you never know. Um, I don't think that they will ask me to be on any committees or anything like that. It's just, you know, um, so, you know, I'm not getting paid. And, uh, it's, uh, although they might you know, know that you have trouble saying no. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? We'll see. I, I was a little reluctant to get into this just for those kinds of reasons, sure. but you know, we had the, um, the, um, the Division of Nuclear Physics in the APS um, has an annual fall meeting, and it floats around. But every five years or so, it goes to Hawaii. And this year, in, it was in Hawaii right after Thanksgiving. Um, and uh, so uh, even though I am not supported uh, by the lab or anybody, um, my wife and I, we have so many friends that were going to be there, we, and it's Hawaii. So we said, let's just go. And so we went at our own expense and went to the meeting in Hawaii. And I saw all these people from Berkeley <laughs> that I know. And, and every one of them said, well, why don't you get an affiliate status at the lab? And I'm going, I, I don't know. I don't know. And I, I realized after I, that I enjoyed seeing them so much uh, that I should do it. And uh, so one of the problems is it's, it's, you know, it's only 45 minutes away if there's no traffic, but there's never no traffic. Sure. Uh, and so, but there's a bus and a BART that I can do. So I'm thinking that maybe that's the way to go is take public transportation. Okay. And uh, so we'll see. I, you know, it's still, uh, it's still some work in progress here. <laughs> Well, Bob, let's wrap. I want to ask a few retrospective questions about your work mm -hmm. and career, then we'll end looking to the future. So on the physics side, I wonder you know, if you can reflect on what it all means, your, 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 your very important work on, on nucleon structure. What do we now know and how has a new generation of physicists taken that research in new directions? Yeah, well, uh, the, um, I, I think the one thing I, I did that had the most impact was I, so it was kind of an interesting thing because, um, so I've always been interested in the weak interaction and um, the, um, <laughs> so back in 1988, some theorists came up with an idea that you could try to figure out if there were, you know, you know, the, that a proton or a neutron, you could make it up only of up, what are called up and down quarks. And you don't need the other flavors of quarks. But some theorists speculated that actually there could be a significant number of strange quarks in, in the proton, say. Uh, it'd be strange quark and I quark, because you can't, you know, you have to make pairs. Um, and, um, and they wrote a paper in 1988 that said, well, um, maybe you could measure this uh, using the weak interaction with neutrinos. And I read this paper and I said, I, you know, I had actually studied this subject before. It just wasn't interesting before. And now they're saying it's interesting. And so I said, okay, I think that the way to, to, way, to way to measure this is by using the uh, spin dependent electron beam using what's called parity violation. So I published a paper in 1989 that said that. And it spawned a whole program of people working for 20 years uh, to try and measure this. Uh, in the end, we showed that the number of strange quarks is very small <laughs> and the theorists were wrong. So it sounds like a bit of a dud, but um, it allows people to now continue to develop the theory without having to worry about the uncertainty of these strange quarks. They can just work with the up and down quarks and not worry about it. And so actually that was an important development. And it also pushed the technology of studying these very small, these are part 
per million asymmetries, they're very small and hard to measure, pushing the technology that led to subsequent generation of experiments, like the one that I mentioned earlier, that you can measure the neutron skin in a lead nucleus using the same parity violating effect. Um, and that's something that's relevant to LIGO and all kinds of things, it's interesting. And there's a new experiment that's a uh, successor to one we did at SLAC back in the 90s to measure uh, the parity violation in electron-electron scattering, something called Muller scattering. And that's just being built at Jefferson Lab. I had a lot to do helping my friends get it all approved through the process and getting funded by DOE. And they are, they're well on their way to building the experiment, supposed to start up in 2025. And... Um, so uh, it led, I, I think the pushing the technology has led to this new generation of these experiments that, that do other things other than uh, study the nucleon structure. And at, on the administrative side, what do you feel at Jefferson Lab that you helped put in place that, that is securing Jefferson Lab's significance, its, its relevance well into the future? Yeah, I would say two things. One is I I, uh, I initiated something called a Laboratory Director of Research and Development, LDRD. Um, all of the other big labs like Berkeley and Oak Ridge and Argonne have had this for a long time. Uh, but Jefferson Lab didn't have it. They had some a weird argument that, well, we're just a nuclear physics lab, so we don't need it. Um, but it's a way of developing new technologies and new ideas. And, it, and, and so I decided to try to start it at the lab. And it was really interesting because people would come forth with, with all kinds of interesting ideas. Um, and, uh, you know, haven't really seen anything pan out to be fantastic yet. But um, some of them have been, you know, pretty significant. And um, so it, it, and if nothing else, it actually is really good for the morale of the staff because they feel like they have this new program that they can uh, try to uh, pitch their creative ideas, right? Um, so it's actually, it was very successful. The Department of Energy gave us high marks for starting this. And, you know, when I went there, it was just poo poo, no, nah, we don't do that. So I thought that was good. The other thing I would say, is the people I managed to hire and put in place. Uh, and so, um, and the, the, you know, it's very talented people that are really moving the lab forward. Um, and including, especially, uh, we, we hired the uh, head of computer science and technology. Uh, we stole her from Slack. And, um, and that she, that her presence at Jefferson Lab has enabled them just a month, a couple months ago, they were, uh, they were told by the Department of Energy that they were, are getting a new project to build a high performance data facility, which is probably $300 million computer facility um, for, and, and this, so this is broadening the program of, uh, of Jefferson Lab away from nuclear physics to do other things in, in the computational space. And, and that will enable them to have connections with with all the other programs beyond nuclear physics uh, in, in the DOE complex. So uh, I think uh, just putting some of these key people in place has really enabled uh, the lab to go new places and do new things that uh, they hadn't been able to do before. And I, I'm, I'm very proud of that. Well, finally, Bob, looking to the future, and especially because you now have this special opportunity at Berkeley to stay connected, what excites you as you look ahead? What are the frontiers where you think there's a real chance for, for breakthroughs and discovery? Well, I, you know, cosmology, dark matter, dark energy, and Berkeley is uh, always, has always been uh, deeply involved in, in these things. Uh, and I have friends working on, on those on, on experiments in those areas. So um, I'm hoping we'll see some startling new results that will shed some light on these remaining puzzles that we have in, in cosmology. That's, uh, that's something I'd really like to see. Are there any experimental or observational efforts currently in existence or planned for the future that you're most bullish on for helping achieve these breakthroughs? Um, well, these there are these big 
liquid xenon uh, dark matter detectors. And, uh, the most recent one is LZ. I used to be on an advisory committee for them, and they have a big presence from Berkeley. Actually, it's co-managed by Berkeley and, and uh, Slack. Um, and uh, the uh, HEPAP just had their version of long-range plan that they call the P5 report, and they have recommended uh, – They've recommended two interesting things. They, the next generation of that type of experiment, a bigger one, would would push it to. Uh, it's kind of you know people always have these funny terms. Push it to the limit of what you can do, given that the uh, the universe is also full of neutrinos, and that would then confuse you, called the neutrino fog. And so there's another generation of those, but that will probably take ten years. Um, and there is new. They call it fourth generation cosmic microwave background experiment to study polarization of the uh, microwave background. And this is something, one of the experiments had uh, a hint a few years ago, but it turned out it was due to dust, a spice up experiment. Um, and so this will be uh, the next generation of that. Hopefully we'll see polarization that's indica indicative of gra gravitational radiation generated uh, right after the Big Bang. So, so that would be a fundamental uh, discovery. Um, so they've approved uh, this as the highest priority thing to go forward in high energy physics. Um, and um, I'm sure Berkeley will be uh, involved in that. Uh, the leader is... Uh, a guy named John Karlstrom he used to be at Caltech uh, in uh, early days uh, when I was there. And he's at the University of Chicago now. Uh, and um, so I'm hoping to see, uh, I, I still remember the colloquium back in 2001 or two, and Andrew Lang and John Karlstrom got up and showed us the pictures of the early universe. And it was stunning. It was just sent chills down your spine. Hoping that I get another uh, another experience like that or two. That'd be <laughs> That's <nice>. great. <laughs> well, Bob, on that note, this has been a wonderful conversation. I want to thank you so much for spending this time with me.